Hello world, this is CS50 Explained Week 2. I'm here again with CS50's own Dan Armendariz. Hey everyone. <laughs> Who's very happy to be here. Alright, this is CS50 and this is the start of Week 2. So, so what do we have on the docket today? So today we pick up where week one left off and we begin to introduce, well first we do a bit of recap and we introduce a couple of buggy programs uh, to try mm -hmm. to elicit from students an understanding of when code is correct and incorrect. And then we transition to some more sophisticated example. This, uh, examples this week. Last week focused oh. arguably more on C? syntax in C mm -hmm. and this week focuses a bit more on ideas and problem solving while mm -hmm. still closely connected to C as a language. Mm -hmm. So this is just a warm-up exercise here. Sorry, go ahead. So in the style guide, uh, do you allow one line for loops or if statements do not have curly braces? In the style guide, no. We, I think we may acknowledge that they, you can have just a single line of code without the curly braces. That's indeed allowed by the language but we generally encourage students to use them nonetheless, mostly so that we're sending a consistent message and we're not introducing a whole, whole number of exceptions. Mm -hmm. So here you're talking about a bug? This is a bug, and I deliberately omitted the curly braces too, uh, but the goal here is that it doesn't print 10 stars, it prints some other number, and the goal here is to give students an opportunity to read through top to bottom and try to deduce exactly what matters logically mm -hmm. what explains this bug. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I probably should just add the curly braces here because it is perhaps an undue uh, misdirection that they're not there. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity too to reinforce or remind students about counting from zero generally in a program or as a computer scientist. Do no, that's not strictly necessary. So how much into uh, bugs are you going into, into the, like the concept of bugs and how some are logic errors, like this is a mm. logic error that will still compile and just doesn't do the right thing as opposed to compiler errors and some other... Generally, we focus on logical. We define bugs as logical errors and um, since they're surely the, the more interesting ones uh, intellectually and we focus we still introduce students to syntactical errors they can mm -hmm. still prevent a program from working but like the, this? the tougher ones well not syntactic, well, this one's this still okay logic. this is another logical error here where i'm trying to get a new line after there but so i guess here i guess this is the reason why you were showing uh the for loop without the curly braces because otherwise this particular example would Correct, and I obvious. probably would have, that's, that's true. So in retrospect, because I wanted to get to this example, it would have been too much of a reveal to include them there. Mm -hmm. So I think this model works well, right? The students have had nearly four or five days of respite from class time, even though they have, a, have problems set in the intervening days since week one, second lecture. Mm -hmm. But starting a class by having students actually solve a problem that indirectly is reinforcing some of the last week's material, I think it's kind of good and hopefully pulls people in. I also didn't have any videos to show at the start of class, clearly, so we yeah, dove I right in. No advertisements, as you so say, no, or it's advertisements. Gotta, the burden is entirely on me to engage here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Engage. <laughs> so here we are actually adding the, the solution there. Mm -hmm. But this is. This is rationalizing in is part the, uh, the decision to um, <laughs> omit the curly braces there a bit. But the reality is, too, there's so many online references and so many textbooks that students might turn to, um, which they're allowed and encouraged to do, that use slightly different style and different conventions. Maine, for instance, has a different signature in certain textbooks, for better or for worse. Uh, curly brace notation is different, annotation is different. And so it's not, frankly, a bad thing for them to see these kinds of disparities even within class. But that's definitely a challenge in that all of our materials, I, I hope, are self-consistent. But invariably, if a student starts relying on some other resource, they don't necessarily see the same style and the same techniques. And so that's something to be cognizant of. We, shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't be ignorant of it because it, we would be doing them a disservice if they, didn't, if they didn't feel comfortable turning to other resources besides ours. But it seems like that's almost an important thing that you need to... It seems like this is also a training wheel that you don't necessarily remove by the end of the semester is that C60 does have a very specific style, very specific editor, everything is kind of self-contained. And it's, there's 
not many opportunities where it veers off and sort of shows how there's other styles. You know, that, that too. Them to, I should to watch the these CS50 Explain videos because I feel like we're making <laughs> some good points. Or you're bringing up some good points. In fact, I think we could address this head on by showing a simple program and then showing a few different implementations of it, not logically, but just stylistically, right. all of which are functionally equivalent. That might be a good way to just send that message that you're going to see different styles. That, be, but also to justify the style guide. In CS15. Yeah, that, okay, that's fair. I might, you know, week two might be the time to do that. I think week zero or one is too soon. Oh, it's yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe week two or three feels right. Mm -hmm. I should disclaim that we, even though we have a style guide, we don't strictly expect students to enforce it. Indeed, the teaching fellows are encouraged to allow their students to stray from it so long as the students are self-consistent. And certainly among the more comfortable students who have prior programming background, if they want to yeah. have if they want to do sort of X-wing style curly braces and keep uh, curly braces on the same line as actual Batman? code, is it Batman style? Um, oh, it's also called X-wing. X -wing, style? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's good. Um, they certainly That's when should. I don't want to. curly brace is on the same line as the, the next like an else. Yeah. yeah exactly. So end curly brace else start curly brace all exactly. on the same line. You call that Star Wars? No, oh, I've also heard it. I've also heard it. No, not Star Wars. I've heard it called Batman as oh, well. Oh, Batman. Yeah. Okay, that works too. Interesting. Uh, today I learned kind of thing. Yeah. You were talking about how, so actually that, that was an interesting reveal and because I thought one of the axes of, um, in, of the grading rubric was in fact style. Mm -hmm. And I thought they were supposed to adhere somewhat strictly to the style By default, guide. right? Okay. So for the 78% of students who have never programmed before, that is sort of our forceful suggestion. Mm -hmm. But for students who do have some prior experience or who just have comfort enough to stray from ours just because they like the look of it and it feels more natural, that's certainly fine. It's not worth getting into a religious debate over something stylistically, so long as the students are writing very readable code that is indeed self-consistent. Mm -hmm. So this was wonderfully opportune. Around the time of this lecture, uh, it yeah, was revealed that great bug. <laughs> uh, some uh, very popular code had a very significant bug in it, the result of which was that security checks were not being fully implemented in an implementation of a software called OpenSSL. Mm -hmm. And what was nice here is that most of the syntax here is familiar to students. There's some big words there. There's some large variable names. There's pointers, some which dots. we haven't gotten to. Yeah. Um, the dots, in this case, are mine. Um, just ellipses to imply that there was more there. But they, the conditions, I think, make sense. And even though go to is not something we introduce, so actually that's a, a third feature of C that we explicitly don't introduce, but we had to here. Mm -hmm. The key here is that, in the, and what was so germane, of course, is that the curly brace issue recurred in such important security related software. Mm -hmm. So even if a student can't quite understand everything that's going on, I hope that they can understand the essence of this bug. And that, too, hopefully, sort of puts off a uh, um, the proverbial light bulb above their heads mm -hmm. if they were to now read an article about this in the popular press, because this one indeed ended up being discussed in the popular press. Mm -hmm. And this too, so we did the, in CS50 Live, which is some of the live produced uh, episodic content that we produce for CS50 students as well, we actually used the same material. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll be opening this Friday, yeah, oh, actually. Really? <laughs> um, we actually ran through the same material, and then I brought it into lecture a few months later. And little things like this, like zooming in on the code, excerpting only the code that's germane to the conversation <coughs> at hand, and then highlighting it, too, I actually realized was super helpful in explaining the concept. Just opening up a big text file and scrolling through it, I don't think it's the right approach. Mm -hmm. So I tried to distill the problem at hand to its essence, which hopefully this, this does here. It's sort of interesting that very shortly after this bug came out, did Apple release the, their new language, Swift, mm. which mandates, um, it does, it's not optional, it mandates that every statement, like an if statement or for loop, must have curly braces, even if it's a single line. Oh. Yeah. It's kind of... It I don't was, think that's a bad thing. No, it's, it, there is, I wonder if there are any sort of conspiracy theories that... Um, this bug was there for a while. Yeah. In fact, I think if you Google around, you can find the origin story and the year and I think person to whom it was attributed. Oh, it's just a little copy-paste fail. And, uh, yeah, I feel, yeah. And you can test here if your software is or was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. As an aside, so GoTo gets a bad rap in the programming community and is generally frowned upon. It does have some pretty compelling uses, honestly, in some applications, but we deliberately don't introduce it largely because you can certainly work around it in code, but we also don't want students to get into bad habits of control flow. We'd like them to think through all the more carefully the logic of using a while loop, a do while loop, a for loop, 
and go-tos can just be misused a little too easily. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, even I use them in some of the pseudocode I showed to students in the very first week of class, because logically it's nice and clean. Go to this line and it induces a loop. But the reality is that C and most other languages do support these slightly more sophisticated constructs where I think it forces you to make sure your code is clean and you're not just jumping all around your code, which can very quickly become less readable. Do you have a quote unquote go to justification for uh, students that ask about uh, using go to? No, it tends not to come up, um, at least among most students. Um, I can't recall a moment in lecture where it's come up. It might very well come up in sections, especially the more comfortable or perhaps in between sections, where some of the students do have some prior programming experience. Mm -hmm. But I would say exactly that. It can certainly be useful, but we tend not to encourage or even introduce it because it's very easy to misuse. And we're only in uh, the third week of the class here, and we want students to be mastering the basics and the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So here you're talking about the various axes that yeah. problem sets are, are graded. So why these four? These have worked well for us over the years, and they address different aspects of the quality of a student submission. So correctness, of course, is does is it bug free? Does it work as it's supposed to? Uh, design is much, much more subjective. Is this code well written? Do you have five different nestings of for loops, or did you come up with a more readable way of doing something? Elegance, in a way. More elegance, much more subjective, much more subject to debate, but also a way of capturing and providing students with feedback on their code that correctness alone might not capture. Mm -hmm. And style is pretty, is purely aesthetic indentation, variable names, and the pretty printedness of the code. Mm -hmm. Scope, meanwhile, is meant to capture really effort. How much more effort, how much of a problem set did a student try to attempt, irrespective of its correctness, its design, or style, mm -hmm. did they le at least make a, a worthy effort at trying to get something to work, even if it didn't in the end? Mm -hmm. Um, and we also use scope as a multiplicative factor so that if you've only attempted half of the problem set, the effect is to have a cap of 50% of the total possible value. Mm -hmm. What I'm noting here is something we've experimented with over time, um, and I think it works well to have relatively few buckets because we have such a large teaching staff, and even with a relatively small teaching staff, reasonable people may disagree what is a, an A or B or C or a D, and we certainly don't want to have a situation of pluses and minuses in a 10-point scale or worse, a 100-point scale. So we generally distill assessment into three-point scales or five-point scales only to improve the probability that two different people will generally uh, lean towards similar scores, but that's absolutely not the case. Indeed, at the end of the semester, we have significant skew across the teaching staff. In fact, we tend to find that the, L, the older TFs um, tend to grade more harshly or lower mm -hmm. scores, presumably because of more experience. They can catch more things. They have stronger opinions. Um, but we normalize for that, and we adjust it at the end of this term so a student's not disadvantaged by that. But simplicity is the goal. The fact that we multiply correctness by three, design by two, style by one usually is meant to, one, just be a simple formula that's completely transparent, but also to capture the reality that you might spend most of your time getting a program to be correct, and therefore it's reasonable, I think, for it to be weighted more heavily than style, which is something that you can generally do pretty quickly, especially if you're doing it along the way. And so we want to ascribe different weights to those time expenses. So the, the slide about academic honesty just flashed by, but I want to actually ask a couple more questions about sure. the, uh, the grading. I, I think th another compelling argument about the relatively small buckets is that, and perhaps you mentioned this, uh, but I'm not sure you, you mentioned it directly, was that <clears throat> it allows you to spend less time worrying about the specific, uh, the specific numeric grade that yes. the student gets. So. Uh, trying to decide the difference between an 85 and an 86, for example, as, yes, as absolutely. example grades, is, is becomes very difficult, especially in these more subjective axes like design and, um, Correct. and, and well, style, you have a style guide, which helps make that a little bit more objective. But. Well, and this is why we also assign sort of unofficially words to those five points. Like three is meant to be good. You look at the code and you Good, you know, room for improvement for sure, but it's, it's not bad, it, it's good. And you know, of course we can disagree as to what good actually is, but generally people might have an innate sense of at least where those lines roughly are. And then there's better and there's best, and then fair and poor. Um, and that's meant to sort of give a, an intuitive model for what we hope the numbers will mean, even though again, we tend to normalize because reasonable people will certainly disagree. And is it, do you find that uh, TFs tend to gravitate towards one of the particular buckets? 
Some T, well, it depends on the TF, honestly, and it depends on their age and their experience and personality, I think. Um, too often do I think some of the grades skew a little high, and in fact, we definitely see occasions where students are getting fives, especially early in the term, and they really shouldn't be. Like, there is room for improvement, and um, one of the goals of TF training, which we try to do weekly throughout the semester, is to try to also introduce um, heuristics and grading techniques to the teaching staff themselves and to make them better because I think it's better, especially early on in the term, that we are on the side of being a little harsher on students than a little easier. We want to make sure we don't cross the line of being outright discouraging and ushering them from the course altogether by being too, by giving them too many pores or fares. But generally, the overarching guidance I give to the TFs is that most students in the beginning of the semester should be getting no higher than threes. Like, their code is good. Right? If it's already best, they probably don't belong in the class itself, which happens in some cases where students just have more comfort than they need for an introductory course. Mm -hmm. But we want them to have some trajectory. And so over time, we sometimes try to tinker with the psychology of it all, where there comes a point mid-semester where we want students, especially when the material is getting harder, to feel all the more motivated and, and sort of encouraged. And so we deliberately try to allow scores to rise over time, too. To one, capture the improving quality of code, hopefully, but also to kind of spur people to the finish line and make them feel encouraged that they're, in fact, on an upward trajectory, even as the difficulty is simultaneously ramping up. Now, this is a particularly sensitive subject um, and a very uh, an all too common one, uh, especially in the context of computer science classes, academic honesty. And I actually like the state of where our uh, academic honesty policy is, which is now <laughs> juxtaposed against this ridiculousness, where be reasonable is it in a nutshell. But then we, ex we spell out in much more detail some representative bullets of behaviors we deem reasonable and behaviors we deem unreasonable. And I would elaborate on what we mean by reasonable, whereby if two students are working nearby each other or friends, and one of those students has some bug or some problem with his or her code, the general heuristic that the policy spells out now, that that student who's struggling may show his or her code to someone else, even a student in the class, who can then provide feedback and help them identify and solve the bug, so long as the helper does not allow the situation to devolve into one where he or she just shows the student who's struggling uh, his or her own code, which would cross that line. And I think that's a reasonable heuristic where we uh, try to empower classmates to behave in a TF-like capacity, a teacher-like capacity, without the situation devolving into just, oh, here's how I did it, and use this, which is not beneficial. Do you think that's realistic to how programmers approach problems in the, in the real world? Very, yeah, because I mean, it's going to be rare that your colleague has the working solution on his or her screen and can just show you. Rather, they're coming but at the might, situation. A, a, a clever Google search might actually find mm -hmm. the solution that you want. Oh, absolutely, but we evolve to that technique later in the term, especially when we get to web programming, where it's perfectly reasonable and it's indeed advantageous to have access to Stack Overflow and any number of online resources. Early on, though, it's going to be, generally, you'd be Googling only for solutions to specific problem sets that are surely out there. And that's not going to be instructive, I think, to see the solution. Rather, once their projects get, um, and the problem sets get larger scale, so that really you're looking for a solution to this problem or usage of some function or something like that, it's a lot more reasonable, I think, to Google for a solution to a subset of your problems, but not something that characterizes the essence of a problem set. Which is, and so shortly after that, we saw the regret clause. And it seems to be something that's been new, isn't it? Relatively Indeed, relatively a touchy one too, but very worthwhile in the end, and dare say successful. We introduced in fall 2014 a so-called regret clause, one sentence to the long-standing syllabus, wherein we encourage students, if they did commit some act that the syllabus might uh, explicitly or implicitly define as un not reasonable, thereby crossing the line of academic uh, honesty into dishonesty, that so long as they come forward to the course's heads, myself among them, within 72 hours, we will handle the matter internally, and there will still be some penalty, like a zeroing of the problem set in a conversation with me, but we wouldn't escalate it higher, higher to the level of Harvard College, for instance, which would generally be the practice. And this g is certainly resulted in quite a few conversations, um, largely between me and the college, and the process that we had adopted. But by the end of the semester, we had 19 students take advantage of this clause. 19 students who had, would never before have had that sense of empowerment and invitation to come forward and own their behavior and accept the consequences um, 
than we'd had in the past, where we didn't have this outright encouragement. And curiously, our, it had fun, as best we can tell, no statistical impact on the rate of academic dishonesty that we detected in the class. Indeed, we did not see a drop in the number of academic, in the cases of academic dishonesty in the class. Those were unfortunately largely unchanged. So what I'd claim is that we identified a subset of CS50's population for whom there really was a compelling opportunity for a teachable moment. Because I had very heartfelt conversations with 19 students that were maybe 10 minutes long to an hour long, a couple of which identified some personal challenges and is latent issues that the students were experiencing. And in almost all of those cases, too, the situation was explained by exactly what we expected. Late night moment of poor decision making, a stupid decision at 4 a.m. under a lot of stress, no food, no sleep, to just grab someone else's code and submit it largely as his or her own. And you wake up the next morning, and for years, certainly while I've been at the helm of the course, you essentially then just have to hold your breath and hope that it goes undetected. And there was no outlet for students to, in a relatively safe space, own up to the poor decision they had made. And we're absolutely going to preserve it in some form and likely introduce all the more of a support structure and an advisory process this coming year so that indeed students feel encouraged to own up to the mistakes they've made, but also make it as educational and uh, more educational than it is punitive alone. How do you detect academic dishonesty? So, it, and how easily will others that are using this curriculum be able to do the same? There are a number of tools out there, um, freely available actually. Stanford has one, uh, Princeton has one. In Stanford's case, it's called MOSS. In uh, Princeton's case, it's MOSS. In Princeton's case, it's called eTector. Um, and these e are tools, eTector, E-T-E-C-T-O-R. Um, these are software tools that have been developed by faculty and are used at both of those institutions and also made available to faculty um, teaching programming courses. And essentially, the software allows you to compare pairwise any number of submissions. So we, for instance, in CS50, compare every submission from every student for over the past eight years in this case. So to every other submission? To every other every submission. Other. So this is like big O of N squared <laughs> yeah. comparisons. So it takes some time. And what it yields for us is essentially an HTML page of potentially worrisome similarities between two students here, 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 and via hyperlink, hyperlinks, can you just click and round by a syntax highlighting that the tools generate? Can you see what the software felt was similar? And it doesn't just compare them identically. It uh, quantizes the information in a way that even if a variable name is slightly changed, mm -hmm. uh, the tools are, av are aware of the language's nuances itself. And so that alone is not sufficient to evade detection. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we spend quite a few hours of human time looking at what the computer recommends are unlikely similarities or worrisome similarities, mm -hmm. and then it's ultimately human eyes that adjudicate whether or not a case should be escalated to um, a uh, investigative further process mm -hmm. for further action. Um, but it's, it's important, I think. It's an incredibly painful and distasteful process, and I hate spending the time on it, but I do think it's important, one, because we have an opportunity to intervene and hopefully provide those students who do cross these lines with some form of teachable moment, albeit in a more punitive context than the regret clause encourages, but also to be fair to the other students, to the super majority of students who are indeed acting in good faith, and I don't think it'd be fair to put them at a disadvantage simply because others are crossing these lines. And how many cases of academic dishonesty do you typically see? In our case, with an 800 student class, uh, not a dozen or more is not uncommon. It's generally, it's, it's highly variant every year. It's about 3% of the class every year uh, because that's the number of cases, but a case would involve two or more students typically. Um, ah, I see. And the challenging part for us is that we can generally, with high confidence, say, a line was crossed here because this is just not likely to happen statistically, these similarities. What's not clear to us as the class is whether it was student A or B or A and B who were complicit in the act or if the code was taken or if one was unaware. Um, and so for that, Harvard has an, a so-called administrative board who intervenes and speaks with the students and tries to figure out exactly what happened, which we don't have eyes into. We don't handle it internally in those cases. And so you, you mentioned some tools to check students against each other, but do you also have some way of checking against, say, someone doing a Google search for Good CS50's question. problem set three solution? Or we wouldn't have a way of detecting the Google search. We would have a way of detecting the outcome whereby we add to our own repository of code um, solutions that people have written over the years to CS50's problem sets and posted on GitHub or their own website. Because the reality is a student who can Google for a solution uh, is certainly an action we can take ourselves, Googling for 
uh, CS50 problem set three solution that probably will yield even today a non-zero number of submissions. But we too add those to our repository because there's this, you know, there's this tension. I think many students are proud of the work they've accomplished in this or some other course and understandably want to be able to show in a very GitHub style way what the quality of their code is like. So I don't think that's inherently a bad thing, but it does become you know, a potential opportunity for a student in the class to abuse, but we can find those same codes ourselves. And, and the reality is, too, often the teaching fellows who are so close to the situation have gotten a sense of the student's code, at least if this is an anomaly mid-semester that the student has crossed some line, and notices that the quality of this code is not consistent with last week's or the previous several weeks of code, or the code is written in a way that just is unlikely to be consistent with a, in, a student in an introductory course. Mm -hmm. It's either too sophisticated or too complex or too curiously commented. It's mm -hmm. something that just doesn't feel right. And so generally just Googling some key phrases or comments or variable names leads us to the source of those things. Mm -hmm. So it's never a fun process, but I do think it's important to maintain I think the reputation and of fairness um, in the class to the the, sh the sheer number of students who are not crossing those lines. It's amazing how it, there there really is almost a bit of a, a signature to the the style the student style of programming. And after just a few weeks of looking at their yeah, submissions, you, get you can sense. really get a sense. Of, you can't necessarily put your finger quite on it, but right. you notice some you know something's different, and then that is cause for human concern. So, right. and this is why it's not entirely automated. We would have a massive number of tragic false positives mm -hmm. if we relied on software alone, and that's why we do spend tens of hours. And usually, a couple of us will have a couple layers of defense so that one of the teaching staff will take a first pass shorten the list, I'll then take uh, another pass so that it's going through multiple sets of eyes too. And do you find that, I mean it seems like it, it, it's pretty natural as a consequence of all of this that most of the cases that you find happen later on in the semester once the problem sets have become sufficiently advanced that you really do have many different styles, mm -hmm. and many different possibilities for completing the problem set and also once the TFs themselves have more of a sense of their own student styles. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you catch many early on, or, or do you have to wait before you start to We see tend cases? not to look early on, partly because the programs in the early part of the semester, even though they're challenges for students, they're not very long, and mm -hmm. the reality is there's only so many ways you can implement Mario's Pyramid, right, mm -hmm. before the code just naturally looks like another student's. Mm -hmm. And so I would worry that we'd have too many false positives early in the term, even with human eyes, where these two Mario implementations look pretty similar. And what I don't want to do is err on the side of accusing the student or causing them undue stress or um, um, uh, mental anguish, honestly, if we don't have enough data on which to act. And so I'm much more comfortable with waiting till the end of the semester or closer to the end of the semester, when then we can look for a pattern where if not only Mario is similar, but also P set two and sort of P set three and very much P set four, mm -hmm. then we can intervene with a lot more confidence that we are, we've identified an actual problem and are not acting um, based on mere chance. So it sounds as though you mostly catch then students for whom this is a pattern and that or for whom it's an outright copying of code, line for line, character for character, where we can also feel confidence. So in a way the regret clause is meant to capture or at least be aware of, of the others, the one-off that are a little more subtle and... Uh... Well, not so much that. I wouldn't say it's at all motivated by the, the possible situation, by those kinds of details. It's entirely motivated by providing the students with an opportunity to wake up a day or when they finally sleep during that period with an opportunity to wake up and have an, oh my God, what did I do? And to be able to do something about that without having to um, wait to see if it's detected at term's end. Mm -hmm. Or putting themselves in into an ambiguous situation where they do speak up, but we have not defined clearly what the boundaries of the consequences are going to be. And so I think that's what we've done too. And even if the consequences were to be more severe, to at least state it clearly so that the students appreciate and know within what boundaries they're operating. And I think that's one of the things we did. We put something in writing, which, and we made a, a social contract with the student, if you will. So before we zoom too far past yeah. some of the material on the board, I should note that one of the goals of this relatively simple example here was to write a function similar in spirit to what's in the CS50 library, like get int, mm -hmm. but to kind of refine it and call it, in this case, get positive int, which allows us an opportunity to discuss how you can layer one function on top of another, right? Because get positive int is just a special case of the get int case. And so now we have an opportunity to not only implement our own function, 
but also to not implement it from scratch in the complexity that is getint in the CS50 library, but to use getint and then wrap it with a little bit more logic to filter out any negative inputs. Mm -hmm. It's also an opportunity more mechanically to talk about function prototypes and the C parser and uh, how it expects a declaration of a function before you actually use it. So some lower level details that we, we want to get out of the way at some point. Mm -hmm. This was a, so this was an interesting one. So a student asked what would happen if I put a declaration of a function after the definition of the function in this case. And you can see that I'm getting um, still an implicit declaration issue because it's coming too late. Mm -hmm. But this is something that I would think in general doesn't happen all that often, especially after teaching a class for so long that you get asked a question that you just don't know. But I think it's a good thing, especially when you have a computer and a compiler in front of you, to show students, to certainly admit that you don't know it, but to show students how you would answer the question. Right? You don't need to result, resort to Google. You don't need to email your teaching fellow to answer this question. Try it. And I think this is something too many students don't appreciate. Like when we often get asked questions, not quite this one, but others in section and elsewhere, like, well, what, what, would, what would happen if? Mm -hmm. Well, just do it. And, right. you know, not to throw the, an the question back at the student, but to sort of teach them to teach themselves, so easy to answer. Mm -hmm. And even I, occasionally, when prepping for class, I've heard realize, you know, if I, if I don't really know what the answer to some question is, I'll just whip up a really quick Hello World-like program and take it out for a spin and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I don't think students should be afraid of that. And I also think they should realize that it doesn't take that long to whip up a program of just a few lines and to distill their question into the simplest program possible. Seems like there's a good opportunity there for some exercises for the the instructor to make that more explicit to actually ask some. Oh, you mean me? Yeah. Well, this is your you way of or, or whomever is is teaching the curriculum to actually have some exercises where perhaps there are some corner cases that you weren't able to go through in class, and so you yep. actually ask the students, well, what would happen if you do this? And encourage, no, them not a bad to, idea. And encourage them to actually try it and execute. And it could be simple things like, you know, what <laughs> happens if you omit a semicolon from a one-line program, where mm -hmm. sort of logically it shouldn't be necessary because there's only one line of code, but C's not going to like that anyway. Mm -hmm. Or what happens if you, uh, like uh, in week one, what happens if you have nested quotes inside of nested quotes? What's mm -hmm. going to happen there? I like that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to make note of that too. So here we're talking about data types, which is something that um, some languages have, some languages haven't, um, either implicitly or exp explicitly. Mm -hmm. I think I saw, did you bring the this day, it looks like you brought the Tupperware again. Just, is that with the Tupperware with the... Uh, On the left there? It's either a printer it's or not a printer. the Tupperware with the, the ping pong balls. The ping pong balls? balls? We'll have yeah. to see if we zoom in again. This should be... I'm not, it's not, you're, you're saying, have I learned my lesson by week two? <laughs> Obviously you have not watched your own videos on CS50 Explained. No, that's what because we're doing right know. here. Yeah, you would know. No, this to, is unscripted. <laughs> Unplugged live content. <laughs> it's interesting to uh, to watch your wardrobe evolve over time too. Last just a week ago, you had the t-shirt, shirts. had a t-shirt, and uh, now you're wearing a white shirt. Uh, it's actually a light purple, but yeah. But white does not work well on the camera sometimes, since uh, the contrast is not ideal. Mm. So generally I do wear black, but you can see the touch of black there. This is the kind of detail that you would be reprimanding me if I brought up. Well, you know, why not? <laughs> so here we're talking, of course, about the, the size of data types. Something else interesting going on right now. I would disagree. <laughs> but this is actually going to lead us to a very real world problem where in this lecture we introduce students to some actual um, engineering disasters that have happened in the past because of an underappreciation of these kinds of nuances where if you only have a finite amount of storage, there's only a finite number of values you can represent. And if you don't anticipate your variables' values being um, staying within some bound, or rather, if you don't anticipate them growing beyond some bound, you might very well write some very flawed software that in the real world can have very real world consequences. And there's a new one now, the, um, the Boeing yes. 787, uh, which requires Reboot a restart your airplane. every six months or something. That was months. atrocious yeah, that, that to was see a, something like that. That would be a good one to go, to go over. Next year, actually, I year. made notes. Um, so yeah. coming fall 2015, 
an explanation of what's being talked about right here. Yeah, so stay This will be CS50 explained, explained, yet and again. Right, yeah. but we're pre-explaining. We're pre-explaining, but we don't want to spoil. But it, right. and it has to do with Boeing. And it, it has, has to, to do, do with, with data types. Data types. Yeah. So if you Google that, maybe, you'll get a, a sneak preview <laughs> of where we're going. Yeah, that was terrifying. Is it, though? That a I modern mean, airplane needs to be rebooted? Well, that I that's think the solution. There's, there's kind of an why interesting, don't you just check the value? There's kind of an interesting assumption that you use a larger number. Why are you not rebooting your plane every eight? Months? Why should you have to reboot your plane? Because it requires a maintenance cycle every like three okay, months. Okay, I'd or something like them like to that. be maintained, but I don't yeah. think you have to pull the plug entirely. But it seems totally reasonable that this bug, I so to like speak, would occur to be after built into longer the software, than twice as long human, of the maintenance cycle. Human conventions. Maintenance cycle is not a human convention. That's an engineering convention, which you would know if you had taken an engineering class. Wow, yeah. we're already there. That's a reference to last, last time. <laughs> wow, this is CS50 attack. <laughs> so here we're talking about overflow and what happens if you have a byte's worth of bits, this always, all of which are now ones. What happens when you try to add one more value? I, I always found this super distracting because this always seems like it should be one of those um, optical illusions. Where the right end, that right bar looks like it should be shorter than the you left don't see bar. the you don't see the hidden image here. <laughs> the the purple dots between the. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> if you're seeing purple dots, we should talk about that later. <laughs> it's funny in um, our forensics piece set, we often have this random red noise or seemingly random red noise that's used to obscure some cyan uh, hidden image, mm. and. For a while, I was going through a phase where I thought it would be funny when giving talks or even class to put up that red noisy image and ask people to see what the, what the hidden image is. And you know, people would lean in and they probably like let their eyes go out of focus like one of those magic puzzles. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it like that. Like You actually need to distort the color somehow or apply a filter somehow. Um, but yeah, I realized it wasn't that funny. Um, and I'm re-realizing that. Yeah. <laughs> like most of the most of the things. You know, so. fun fact too, and we can say this. Uh, well, plenty of students have figured I'm this out. Still waiting for your fun facts to actually be a fun <laughs> fact. This is a fun fact. In fun our forensic piece at two, the same file, where you have the red noise. It turns out that on most laptop screens, the technology of the display is such that you screen. tilt it up, which essentially yeah. changes your perception of the image, and you don't have to write a single line of code to see that it's. Uh, the Fozzie Bear, or Rob Bowden, or any number of other hidden Fozzie images Bear. over there. How many students understand Well, that it's reference. funny because the Muppets <laughs> kind of disappeared from the, the spotlight for quite a while. And I still remember to this day, a couple years ago, a student taking CS50 online did successfully recover the image of a certain Fozzie Bear, but didn't. But the question in the piece said is, who done it? Who is it? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And his response, I think, on, on Facebook was, so I recovered the image, but who is this hairy man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was Fozzie Bear. Yeah. But coming soon to ABC, the Muppets. Everyone will know the Muppets. You're soon. plugging the Muppets now? I'm plugging. Uh, yeah. This yeah. so if it's already happened, then it's already started. But you know, there's a there's As a small you know, window on there's TV a today. Window. The Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> You're just hoping that that will reignite. In my interest in our friend of my, our problem sets. No, you're just hoping that people will start to understand your, your reference. It's so better. old that it's now come full circle. As soon as I bring Seinfeld back to, I'm going to have so much more material. Seinfeld's back. Nah. Comedians in cars getting coffee. Google it. No, I mean the show, not the comedian. The show, I see. With George and Elaine and Kramer. Yeah. How many people do you think are fast forwarding at this point? Oh, most. <laughs> <laughs> Views. There's a good cat video Views. somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so here we're talking about imprecision. So today really is about, and I even had the slide up just to kind of def, uh, scope the discussion, data representation. Because this is actually kind of a juicy topic, and at least in a language like C, there's non-trivial implications of how you represent information um, and how you use operators like uh, division in this case. Um, and this is one of these subtle details, but as we'll see at the end of class and as we keep alluding to, I mean, it has very real world implications of misappreciation of these details. And so this is yet another reason why I like working with students at the beginning of the semester at this lowest level and sort of building this ground floor up appreciation because clearly um, it's sometimes taken for granted with real consequences. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of neat too, and this took a little 
trial and error to figure out what the right values were to really expose this issue um, for the format specifier for and such. Issues? Yeah, I wanted to sort of claim boldly that one divided by 10 is not in fact 0.1 like you've been taught. It's in fact that number, which of course is not true. Well, it is, it is in fact. 0.1 like you've been taught. But well, this, it, is a, this is this not, is not it's a representation. One, right, this is about as close as we can get to that precise uh, representation. So the issue here, of course, is imprecision. So why don't you go into more detail about why this actually happens? Like, me as a student, I'd be very interested to know why is my computer not capable? Good question. My understanding, would my, my intuition here is that my computer's not capable of the precision, but that's not necessarily correct. No, it's how it's being represented, for sure, um, in addition to how many bits you might have at your disposal. Um, we What's could. That? It's mostly it's a judgment of time. Like, mm -hmm. I, I've chosen not to spend time on the representation of floating point values. Juicy topic. Mm -hmm. And my only disinclination, disinclination would be to just not skate too close to super, super low-level details, because, again, we're only in the third week of the class here, and I don't want um, eyes to glaze over. And I also don't want to send a message that unduly suggests that what we're about to spend the entire semester doing is math or is numbers or these low-level details. Like, we're really going to focus on higher-level problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say this is not a good topic that we shouldn't go into, especially in section or maybe even lecture, but I just try to strike that balance early in the term of looking underneath the hood but then quickly taking a step back to make sure that we're keeping sight of uh, the overarching goal. Like many things, it sounds like the, especially early on, you want to keep the abstraction level relatively high while still just introducing bits yeah. and pieces at a time. And but maybe by around problem set seven, which is the finance oh, problem sure. set, then, then imprecision certainly would become more important. And so having a deeper discussion might be warranted. Agreed. And you know, another topic in the same vein that we don't spend much, if any, time on in a given semester, it's dependent on the year, is bitwise operators, which are actually mm -hmm. a wonderfully interesting topic. Mm -hmm. But there too, I don't want us to get too much into the weeds when early on we're trying to kind of ramp up in terms of the higher level challenges. Um, so it's a just it's a trade-off, and it varies semester by semester. Yeah. Honestly, I think it, for the most part, and at least for a lot of the content of this class, unless you were to actually introduce a problem set that needs bitwise operators, that seems to be a reasonable. Well, that's the thing, and in uh, over time, I've actually decision. removed certain topics from the class. Like bitwise operators used to be in the semester. And then I realized I'm not really motivating these very well. I'm introducing them because I feel this obligation as a computer scientist, like let's make sure students have been exposed to this, this idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it never really fit and it was hard to motivate. And so then I sort of tacked it on to the end of the semester as a more advanced topic, but it didn't fit there. And then I just decided, you know what? If it doesn't really belong, let's take it out altogether. Maybe make it optional material, but not just jam it in there because I feel we need absolute coverage of everything. I'd much rather motivate things more, um, more genuinely, so that students actually have an appreciation for it, and not just a vague recollection of some random topic that we spent just a little bit of time on. So I agree. If we had a piece set around it, super compelling. And in the past, we have, in fact, but not not recently. Is this something that? Uh, would be present in one of the hacker edition pieces? Could be. That would be, I think, a good opportunity for it. Um, but it's not currently there. This is, uh, to our point of spoilers earlier, mm -hmm. this was where I wanted the conversation to go in the day, or where I wanted us to climax, which is a look at uh, somewhat dated footage, but of some very real world implications of issues of data representation or imprecision. There's, this reminds me a lot of. Um, uh, is it, it's SpaceX, right? That's Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. uh, they were recently trying to land a rocket on a platform mm -hmm. in the middle mm -hmm. of the ocean, and that's been there's been videos uh, recently of their their attempts, and they're getting closer. They're getting really close. Mm. It's very very tantalizing. But there's there's actually been a lot of discussion about, especially online, about how difficult that this actually is to engineer and to create. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things that I saw was um, there's a, a completely unrelated software program. And it's actually a game called the Kerbal Space Program, mm -hmm. which um, is meant to deal with orbital mechanics and these sorts of things. And there's a lot of jokes for I, I haven't actually played it myself, but a lot of people say everything that they learned about orbital mechanics, uh, they learned in Kerbal Space Program, even really? people who are quote-unquote NASA science, uh, quote-unquote rocket scientists, rather. And um, this reminds me of a video that they were showing that actually 
might be kind of an interesting thing to, to show in, in class as well, which is trying to replicate the physics of mm. shooting a rocket into space and then bringing it back to Earth and how that actually needs to translate in the discussion of the physics engine that goes into the Kerbal Space Program to actually uh, represent appropriately all of the various variables and the precision that's needed to actually right. well, create take a this. look. It's pretty, it's well, pretty interesting. Well, and this is the role, um, one of the roles of lecture, I think, can be, especially as we toggle between sort of in traditional instruction and multimedia like this, is to just keep people engaged and also make clear the connections to the course's material. Mm -hmm. So the more, I love these kinds of opportunities to actually discuss um, actual manifestations of the topics in the class. Mm -hmm. What exactly is this video uh, talking about? It seems like there's a lot of rockets. And so it's mostly, it, it involves militaristic applications or failures in this case. One of a rocket um, where uh, imprecision was to blame for its premature explosion and was killed in that case. But the other uh, storyline here actually relates to the Gulf War, whereby not unlike the Boeing situation, although this one much more severe and costly, um, because of imprecision, the rocket's trajectory would essentially drift over time because oh, as you add up gosh. imprecision plus yeah. imprecision that didn't cancel itself out, you end up having a missile effectively go far from its intended target. And this had very unfortunate consequences in this case. Hmm. But what is nice about these kinds of examples is that assuming you've provided the requisite background or context for the technical issue at hand, it's relatively easy, I think, for students more and less comfortable alike to then wrap their minds around what's going on and the world just begins to make a little more sense. And you also appreciate for something like this, just the omnipresence of computers and software. I mean, I'm not sure it would have occurred to me before watching um, uh, footage like this that there's actually so much software inside something that doesn't even look like a computer, certainly. But that's increasingly common, for sure. And cars nowadays, too. Now, the yeah. big thing about uh, many cars have just literally dozens of computers that are meant to assist with many tasks that were wow. traditionally manually done. Um, and of course, the well, it's a little worrisome if you, cars. Cons if you, you consider how worry. often uh, you know your own computer freezes or crashes yeah. or acts unexpectedly, there are certain things I put my life in that I'd prefer not be buggy. Mm -hmm. Like a plane, perhaps. Plane, car, any number of things, yeah. I mean, software is made by humans in the end, and so humans make mistakes, and so we should appreciate that uh, you know, human labor has gone into these kinds of things. This is quite a, you really didn't want to talk about very much in this lecture, did you? <laughs> this is a longer video, and I always <laughs> have misgivings about using so much, but even though we've been talking over it and therefore sort of disengaging, mm -hmm. um, this one I do think resonates with viewers. Mm -hmm. It's before the age of HD, too. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Four by three aspect ratio, which I'm happy to talk about in more detail. <laughs> so this is the tragic punchline. Translation, reboot your rocket launchers once in a while, mm -hmm. for no definition of once in a while. Right, yeah, not being specific in their specification of what, what was necessary, what they had to code against. And, I mean, tragically, the problem is very now well understood, and even then could be very well identified um, as a software issue, and it's, it's unfortunate that... It's well understood, but it's still easily overseen. Yeah. I mean, there's this. Absolutely. This is the sort of um, low-level detail that many people just tend to sort of ignore nowadays. I think with our higher abstractions and higher level. Well, absolutely. And another one that we'll, you'll still see in the popular press is that of buffer overflow exploits, which we'll actually come to in a couple of weeks in CS50, which generally wait, relates to touching memory beyond the boundaries that you should be allowed to in C, does not provide any built-in mechaniz defense mechanisms against going beyond the boundaries of an array, for instance, or a chunk of memory that you've dynamically allocated. And so to this day, so many exploits of servers or software are the result of a buffer overflow exploit, where someone has figured out that there's some line of code in someone's software that's not checking the 
length of a value and therefore it's going too far into memory and bad things are happening. To this day, this continues to happen. And not just with C, but a few other languages as well. How much is this the failure of that those classes of languages that allow this as opposed to, because it's not necessarily protecting the programmer. So I think there's been a, maybe not a, re, maybe not a new movement, but a renewed movement to look at higher level languages like these and to try to protect the programmer against these sorts of bugs, which well, are inherently, inherently difficult for a programmer to catch in every case. Like they may know about. I don't know if they're difficult to catch in every case. It seems difficult if there's so many examples that are continuously coming out by, by programmers that presumably know better. That I mean, the fact yeah. that these are so prevalent so, sort of argues against the fact that it's that it's easy to catch. Right. Well, I do certainly agree with the sentiment that tools can help with this, and that more recent languages, more recent tool chains have indeed provided programmers with defenses against themselves, and that is a good thing. Um, but I think to your earlier question, I think it's a mix of lack of support in tools that people might still be using or used in yesteryear and with just human error. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a combination of those two. Mm -hmm. Now here we ended with a performance by CS50's own Colton Ogden. This one shot in the studio as in the past. Mm -hmm. I remember from, I think it was week one, Colton had one of these launch pads, and now he seems and to have Indeed, they have doubled. multiplied. And so you know, next week, will we go to uh, four? Exponential growth Exponential in the number growth. of Colton right. launch pads. Yeah. <laughs> it still bothers me that now we have two lights that are perpetually lights. on. But this is pretty remarkable, I think, that he's able to run these both simultaneously. Are they both connected to the same? Because we discussed a little bit about how it works, how it's connected to essentially computer. to a computer that plays the music. I think he has a USB hub to which they're both connected that's in turn connected to his laptop, or he's using two mm -hmm. of his laptop's USB ports. So that they can but it's or the same computer. It's the same computer, or they might be daisy chained together. I can't quite tell uh, in this lighting. Yeah. Very effective lighting to kind of hide the, the implementation the cable. Yeah. We are abstracting away. Look from, at that. <laughs> I can only see the one on the left at the moment. <laughs> but it's nice. This became a thing this year, and adding this musical element to CS50 that, yes, does have this software connection, but it was really meant to be an opportunity to engage students and sort of attract a subset of students to talking with Colton, for instance, about the implementation details and how he does this. Um, and really trying to find some convergence between CS and, in this case, music. Mm -hmm. And much like Ansel, when um, in the last lecture we had him come up and talk about his application of engineering and mm -hmm. software to some extent to the solution of problems um, like in building cars, um, these kinds of intersections are interesting. So we've been increasingly on the lookout, I think, for students and staff and faculty who are doing really interesting work in related, if tangentially, fields. Look, there's an interesting opportunity to talk about music and audio and computers and how yeah. low latency is really important to so that. As soon as he pushes the button that the computer plays the, the sound as quickly as possible so that otherwise it would feel... And we've run into this issue before actually in certain spaces when we've wanted to pipe his music into the, the house audio, so to speak, uh, whereby if there's enough hardware and enough cable length in between him and the end point, there's enough of a delay that it's if like he hearing your own to, echo and it's distracting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he can't be, stay on the same page if his headphones are slightly askew with what you're hearing in the house. Right. So there's some very real AV issues that arise here, and some of which have, could have some very potentially interesting um, technical explanations. Mm -hmm. As an aside, we don't do anything audio really in the problem sets, at least other than Scratch, for instance, is prerequisite, mostly for fear of technical support issues. Mm -hmm. We have so many people using the appliance, which already can be a challenge to get working properly, especially with networking drivers and the like, to also support the innumerable audio drivers that users have, especially on PCs, has just always made us hesitant to create a problem set for which a non-zero number of students just might not be able to get it to work at all mm -hmm. for unfortunate reasons. And we wouldn't want them to feel like they now have to miss out on a component of the class. Mm -hmm. So definitely some risk aversion there that would be nice to get past, but haven't ventured that way yet. Mm -hmm. It's really remarkable to get this perfect for such a long song and with so much complexity. At least what I perceive as perplexity. Uh, complexity. <laughs>